Welcome pre-cal students to class today on Friday the 13th. Um, I apologize for the video being a day late and um, hopefully that problem is taken care of and we won't have any issues again. Um, your exam will start next Friday um, so uh, I need that exam to be turned in before not on before January 7th and when I say turned in that means all of your questions are asked all of the problems are done and you turn it in completely finished before that date. Number two, only one person has turned in test number eight. Only one person, so make sure that you get those turned into me as soon as possible. Okay, on Tuesday we covered these definitions. You can read them yourself. Um, you don't have to memorize them, but I, you, know, you need to know them well enough so you can associate them with the correct numbers. I'm not going to read all this to you, but also on Tuesday we covered these topics here. And so please keep all of these in mind as you study for your semester exam. On Wednesday, we covered these topics here. And so make sure that you read over these and are familiar with these. And then on Thursday, we covered these topics here. Be able to solve a right triangle when given three parts. Okay, There's six, six parts to a triangle. Three sides, three angles. Okay, be able to solve a right triangle when given three parts. Number two, be able to find the terminal side of a given angle. So if I said what quadrant does the terminal side of 490 lie, you should know to go around 360 plus 90 plus 40 more and know right where that terminal side is. So be able to do that. I'm going fast on these because I already went over all this with you on Thursday. I'm just reviewing it just to keep it fresh in your mind. When I ask you to find a positive and negative coterminal angle, let's pretend the angle was negative 105. Well, you would go around 90 plus 15 more degrees negative, so there's the angle. I want you to find a positive and a negative coterminal. Well, the positive would start here and go to here, and so that would be what? 255, I believe, positive. And then the negative would be, well, you have to go here, go around once, that's 360, and then 105 more, so you stop here. So be able to do that. Number four, be able to find the complement and the supplement of a given angle. Complement means they add up to 90, supplement means they add up to 180. Number five, given an array that passes through an order pair, be able to find the trig function. In other words, let's say I have a ray going down like this, and it goes through this point here, which is over 5 and down negative 3. Um, that angle, of course, would be this angle here. Be able to find any of the trig functions of that angle that rotates around. We did one of those on Thursday. Number six, given a linear equation and a quadrant, be able to find the trig function of the angle. We did one of those. Given a trig value and a quadrant, find the other trig function. So if I said the cosine of theta is, I don't know, um, negative one half and I said we're dealing with quadrant uh, let's see where is cosine negative quadrant 2 then you would know to draw your triangle in quadrant 2 and you would know here's your theta you would know the adjacent side would be 1 the hypotenuse is 2 find the other side and then once you find the other side question mark you could then find the other trig functions number 8 be able to find exact trig values of given angles number uh, that was the rest of number eight, and that's it. That's everything we did on Thursday. Okay, if you have test number four, you're welcome to get it out. If you don't want to, that's up to you. We're going to go over test number four. First of all, let's start off by looking at these problems here that deal with central angles, arc length, and radius. Um, in problem number one, uh, we have an arc length of seven inches, a central angle that's 80 degrees. I want you to find the radius. Now, first of all, don't forget what a central angle is. A central angle is an angle inside of a circle that is formed at the center of the circle. We'll call this theta. S is the arc length, and it goes from here to here. That's the arc length, okay? And then R, of course, is your radius, okay? So I better label these for you. S is your arc length, um, and this shouldn't be a T, this should be an R, I'm not sure why I put an R, I apologize. R should be your radius, and of course theta is your central angle. 
your central angle. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and solve these problems. One other thing you need to know about this formula, your central angle must always be in radians. If your central angle is not in radians, then you cannot uh, solve the problem. It must be in radians. And whenever you solve for theta, it always comes out of this formula in radians. Theta is always in radians. So here we go, problem number one. The arc length is seven inches. Um, the central angle is A degrees find the radius. Well, first of all, we're going to use our formula, theta equals s over r. And obviously, we're looking for the radius, so we're going to leave r, r, and the arc length is s, which is 7. Now, theta is 80 degrees. However, remember, when you use this formula, you must make sure um, that your your central angle is in radians and 80 degrees in radians is 4 pi over 9. So that's all I did is I made substitutions. I substituted this in for theta, 7 in for s, and now we're solving for r. Well when you have two fractions that are set equal to each other, we should know by now whenever two fractions are equal you can cross multiply. So 9 times 7 is 63 and 4 pi times r is 4 pi r. Now next we're solving for r so we're going to divide both sides by 4 pi. Okay. Now when you type in 63 divided by 4 pi don't forget to put parentheses around your 4 pi. That's really really important. Okay. So be sure and do that and what you're going to get out if I can type this in correctly is 5.01 so we're going to go ahead and just call the radius 5. So there we go. Simply using this formula right here we were able to find the radius um, for number 1. So not too difficult. Let's take a look now at number 2. Number 2 says find the central angle. So we're looking for theta. So theta equals S is my arc length, that would be 4. Radius is right here. R is my radius, that would be 4. So theta equals 4 over 4. Well, 4 over 4 obviously is 1. So you're like, oh, my answer is 1. Well, hold on. Yes, your answer is 1. That's true. That is exactly right. The angle is 1. But it's not 1 degree, it's 1 radian. Okay? And remember, number two says, I want you to find the central angle in degrees. So now we've got to convert radians to degrees. Anytime you're given radians, you multiply it always. Whatever the radians is, you always multiply it by 180 over pi. Okay? And that would be incorrect. Sorry. You always multiply it by, um, yes, 180 over pi is correct. So 180 over pi. We're going to convert this, uh, no, it would be pi over 180. Sorry about that. It would be pi over 180. Anytime you're converting from um, radians to degrees. Or would it be 180 over pi? This is really getting humorous, isn't it? Old age is setting in on your teacher. I apologize, guys. It would be 180 over pi. So, um, here we go with your calculator. 1 times 180 over pi would be 180 over pi. And now with your calculator, if you type that in correctly, um, you will get 57.29. So I'm going to go ahead and put 57.3. So there we go. Other than Mr. Earhart changing his mind 15 times on this fraction right here, um, that's all you would do to convert from radians to degrees is multiply the radians by 180 over pi, and you will get 57.3. Okay? So pretty simple. It's cut and dried, students. We just simply use this formula, and we solve for the missing variable. All right, number three, we're looking for arc length. My central angle is 120, but we know we cannot put 120 in for theta. It has to be in radians. So 120 degrees in radians is going to be 2 pi over 3. So for theta I'm going to put 2 pi over 3. And then my arc length s is going to stay s, that's my unknown, and my r radius is 2. So now I'm ready to cross multiply. Uh, 3 times s is 3s and 2 pi times 2 would be 4 pi. Now, because we're solving for s, we're going to divide both sides by 3. If we divide this side by 3, they cancel. And we're going to divide this side by 3 also. So we end up with 4 pi 
divided by 3. Don't forget to put your 4 pi in parentheses and then divide it by 3. And you will get 4.188, 4.188, or in other words, 4.2. 4 4.2 would be your arc length. Okay, so there we go, students. We just simply are simplifying in the given values and then solving the equation for what we're looking for. All right, let's go ahead and continue on. We're going to review now how to graph sinusoids. And when I taught this on September 24th, I gave you this here in your notes. And I also gave you seven steps to use. So let's use these seven steps to graph the sinusoid. First of all, convert the radians over to degrees. Well, do we have radians? Yes, we do. Negative pi over 2. And if you convert that over to radians, you're going to get negative 90 degrees. So there we go. Step one is done. That's pretty simple. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look now at step two. Find the vertical shift and put dotted lines on the graph. Well, let's see. What affects the vertical shift? Here it is. See this arrow right here? This number outside the parentheses at the end is the number that affects your vertical shift. So let's take a look at the vertical shift. Positive three. So we know the whole graph is going to be shifted up positive three units. So Let's go ahead and get a decent uh, coordinate plane drawn here. And here we go. We're going to be shifted up three. So step two said to find the vertical shift and put a dotted line there. So we're going to put a dotted line going right through three. Okay. Now let's see what step number three says. Find the amplitude and put dotted lines on the graph. So let's find the amplitude. Now if you'll look at your notes here, the amplitude or the height is always the number right outside um, or right beside the sine or the cosine. So let's take a look at our problem here. We have a negative two right out right beside or to the left of sine. Now don't worry about the negative sign. This two tells us from the center of the graph, it tells us to go up to and then from this center go down to and then your graph will appear all in between uh, these dotted lines okay so let's continue on we have done step three we found the amplitude we put dotted lines in the graph step four find the horizontal shift and write down this number okay sure here we go horizontal shift is this number right here C is what always affects the horizontal or it gives us the horizontal shift so C is going to be negative 90 I'm not sure if you remember this from your notes but you always let's see if I can slide this over just a little um, didn't want to do that All right, there we go. Um, this number right here is what influences your horizontal movement, okay? Now, if it's a negative 90, we're going to put a positive 90. If it's a, if it's a positive 90, negative 90, all of that, it's really not. The sign is not a tremendously big deal. We're going to go ahead and say the horizontal shift here is 90, okay? And we'll come back to that later, okay? 90. Now, let's continue on. Let's go ahead and put H as horizontal shift. Now, find the period and divide it by 4. So first we got to find the period. So what you always do, this number right here affects the period. B, whatever is right beside the X, that number is always going to affect the period. Okay, so let's look at our problem. Um, the number next to X is 2. So what you always do, the 360 will never change. You always take the 360 and divide it by whatever number is next to the X. In this case, it's 2. So the 360 never changes, and you always divide 360 by the number that's next to the X. So 360 divided by 2 is 180, and that is how you find the period. So there's the period of this graph. So we found the period. Now step 5 says find the period, divide it by 4, and write down these partial ordered pairs. Let me show you what they mean, okay? Okay, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to take the period, hold on one second, and we're going to divide it by 4. So if we take 180 and we divide it by 4, what we're going to get is 45, 45 degrees. 
Okay, so I guess I had to pause the video. Not sure exactly what my last sentence was there, but we were on step five. We found the period. Let's go back here. We found the period 180. We divided by four. We got 45 degrees. And don't forget earlier, we knew the horizontal shift was something, and we wrote it down, and that is right here. The horizontal shift is 90. Now, now we're going to get into the sine thing. What I was saying earlier is this. Whenever you're trying to find out the horizontal shift, please listen to me. Please take a mental or a physical note of this. Whatever the sign of this number is, you always change it. If it would have been a positive 90, then our horizontal shift would be negative 90. If you're, if this number is negative 90, which it is, then your horizontal shift is going to be positive 90. Okay, you do need to understand that. Now, what does this horizontal shift do for us? Well, it's the first part of your ordered pair. Now I'm trying to find a place where we can write that and go back and forth without being too confusing. So your horizontal shift, that means the whole graph was shifted to the right 90 degrees. So that means one of my x values is going to be 90 degrees. Now I want a total of five ordered pairs altogether. That's a really good range. Okay, and so with that in mind, um, what I've done now is I realized the graph, because it says negative 90, the graph was shifted opposite a positive 90. Again, if this would have been a positive 90, then the horizontal shift would have been a negative 90. I'm not going to get into why right now, but you always do that, okay? So, with that in mind, um, I know my horizontal shift is 90. Now I know the whole period is 180, and I divided it by 4, which is 45. The reason I did that is this number you get out when you take the period and divide it by 4. That's the number you're going to add to your x value. So we're going to add over and over 45 degrees. So 90 plus 45 is 135. 135 plus 45 would be 180. Now we go backwards the other way. Now we're going to uh, subtract. So we're going to add 45. Then going this way, we've got to subtract. So 90 minus 45 would be 45. And then 45 minus 45 would be 0. Okay? So what I did there is I now have the x values of my five ordered pairs. Okay? So I have all five ordered pairs I need to graph the sinusoid. Now, and that's what we just did, write down these partial ordered pairs. Now, number six, substitute in two values in order to get out two y values. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to substitute two values in. I guess I'll substitute 90 in and I'll substitute 135 in and let's see what we get out. So right here for x I'm going to put 90. So in my calculator I really have y. With my calculator I would simply put negative 2 sine and then 2 times 90. Pretend you're putting a 90 right here for x. 2 times 90 is 180 and 180 minus 90 would be 90 and then plus 3. So I'm going to type that very quickly into my calculator. Make sure you're in degrees, of course. Negative 2 sine of 90 degrees, then hit enter, and then plus 3. And you're going to get 1. So what I know is when I put in 90, I get out of 1. Now let's put 135 degrees in and see what happens. So right here for x, I'm now going to put parentheses and put 135. So 2 times 135 would be 270 minus 90 would be 180. So what I have is negative 2 sine of 180, negative 2 sine of 180 plus 3. So negative 2 sine of 180 enter plus 3. And we're going to get out 3 in that case, okay? 3. So when we put in 135, we got out 3, okay? Now, I'm ready to start plotting my points. What it says here is substitute in two values and get out two y values and then sketch the graph. So I have two values right here, two order pairs, 90 comma 1 and 135 comma 3. So I better start labeling my x axis. Looks like we're going to go with 90, no that's not true, looking at your ordered pairs here, 0, 45, 90, 135. So we're going to start off with 45, then add 45, 90, add 45, 135, add 45, 180, then we'll go back to 0, and then 0 minus 45 is 45, uh, negative 45, and then minus 45 is negative 90, and then negative 135, and then negative 180. Let me pause and get a drink of water here. 
Now let's plot the two values that we know and see if we see if see if we can find a pattern. 91, so over 90 and up one. I'm gonna change colors here. Over 90 and up one goes right there. And then we have 135.3. So over 135 and up one, two, three. So right here. And I think we see the pattern then, guys. I mean, we're going here to here. So 180 would be up here. Now going the other direction, the graph's going to come like this and curve. It's going to hit here and start curving up. So we know 45 would be here. Zero would be up here. 45 would be down here. Negative 90 right here. 135 up to here. And then 180 would be right here. So. So there we go, a pretty good picture of that graph, okay? So that's just a quick review on how to graph sinusoids. Be very familiar with that and know how to do that for the final exam, okay? Let's continue on. Um, let's look at factoring some trig functions here, some trig expressions. Factoring trig expressions. Okay, now as we look at these, um, we can still look at them as binomials and trinomials and all the other terms we've used when we have factored um, <clears throat> algebra expressions and to be honest with you um, the binomials here really are pretty simple I would not worry about converting those over to algebra expressions now the trinomials I might but not the binomials for example I want you to factor tangent squared minus cotangent well it's a binomial and so you say to yourself, do I know the square root or do I know the cubed root of both of these terms? And the, and the answer is you know the square root of both of them. So you put two parentheses, the same size, and you say to yourself, what's the square root of tangent squared? Well, it's tangent. So I put a tangent here and a tangent here. Then I say to myself, what's the square root of cotangent squared? Well, the square root of cotangent squared is cotangent. So I put cotangent here and cotangent here. And then I make one positive, and I make one negative. There we go. We factored it. Let's save number 10 for last. It's the harder one. Let's take a look at number 11. Once again, I have a binomial. So I say to myself, do I know the square root of both of these terms, or do I know the cube root of both of these terms? And the answer is, is I know the square root of both of them, okay, or the cube root. So if I know the cube root of both of these, um, then I'm going to put a smaller, I'm actually going to need some more room. You put a smaller parentheses and then a bigger parentheses, okay? And here's what you do. What's the cube root of this first term? 1. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. So the cube root of 1 is 1. So you put a 1 right here. And what's the cube root of 125 tangent cubed? Well, the cube root of 125 is 5 because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. And the cube root of tangent cubed would be tangent. So what I put right here is 5 tangent x. And then whatever this sign is here, that's what you always bring down and put right here. If this would have been a positive, then we put a positive. In this case, it's a negative, so we're going to put a negative sign right here. Now, we want to put three terms over here. And the question is, how do I get each one of these terms? Well, you look at this term here, and you multiply it by itself. So 1 times 1 is 1, so we put a 1 here. Then you take a look at your next term, which is 5 tangent x, don't worry about the negative sign, and you multiply that by itself. So 5 tangent x times 5 tangent x. And what you're going to get there is you're going to get 25 tangent squared. So that comes over here at the end, 25 tangent squared. And then how do you find the, sorry about that, how do you find the middle term right here? that goes right here. Well, what you do is you take this first term, a 1, and the second term, a 5 tangent x, and you multiply them together. So 1 times 5 tangent x would simply be 5 tangent x. Now, whenever this sign right here is negative, the sign sequence over here um, goes positive, positive, positive. Okay?
Now, if this sign right here would have been positive, then the sign sequence over here goes um, positive and then negative right here and then positive right here. So this sign here always tells you what goes here. And this sign here always tells you what signs you have over here. So let me go over that one more time for you, okay? If this is a positive sign, then over here it goes positive, negative, positive. If this sign right here is negative, then the sign sequence over here is positive, 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 okay? So there we go. So that's factoring a couple binomials. Now let's factor some trinomials, okay? Now what I would suggest for you on these, because they're three termers and they're a lot harder, I would suggest that you rewrite this as an algebra expression. I would write 3x squared for cotine squared x plus 6x for cotangent x plus three. And now let's factor this, okay? The first rule in factoring is always pull out what's common. Well, I can pull a three out of all of these terms because three goes into three, three goes into six, and three goes into three. So pull out a three and you're left with x squared plus two x plus one. Because three times x squared is three x squared, three times two is six x, and three times one <coughs> would be three. Now, Next, I'm going to factor this trinomial. Notice it is a trinomial with a lead coefficient of 1. There's a 1 right there even though you can't see it. And that makes it the really easy kind of factoring. We list out all the factors of our last term. In this case, it's 1. So all the factors of 1 would be 1 times 1, 1 times 1. Notice it's a positive 1 that you have here. So you want a positive times a positive and a negative times a negative. Now only one of these groups adds up to your middle term, positive 2, and it's these two numbers right here. So you're going to put x plus 1 x plus 1. Now, you're not done. Remember, you started off with a trig expression. You rewrote it as an algebra expression. And now that you have factored it, now you got to rewrite it with trig value. So, see this 3 on the outside? I'm going to put a 3. Then I'll put my two parentheses. Now, for x plus 1, I'm going to put cotangent x plus 1. So for the x, I put cotangent x, and then for this x right there, I go ahead and put cotangent x plus 1. So I basically just substituted back in the cotangent x. So there we go. You have factored a trinomial or a three-term trigonometric expression, okay? All right, so be able to on the exam to factor trig expressions. Let's go ahead and continue on if I can get this mouse to work. There we go. On these problems here, we're going to review using the sum and difference identities, and we're going to use those for numbers 12 and 13. Now, take your trig book, if you want to, and look in the very, 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 I mean, turn to the very back. You're so far back, you're actually at the cardboard hard part of the book, and then turn back one page from that, and you'll see a sheet of paper in the back of your book with trig identities written on it. Or you can just get out your trig identity sheet, which you're going to need for the final exam anyways, and just look at that. But somewhere, find your sum and difference identities, okay? Now, when I look at my sum and difference identities, I notice right away for number 12, forget number 13 for a second, for number 12, I see that we're finding the sign of 105. And it says use exact numbers. Now, anytime I'm told to use exact numbers, I'm thinking right away of this table right here. The only problem is my table has 30, 45, and 60 degrees. And 105 is nowhere on there. And and plus the direction said I have to use the sum and difference identities. So um, let me get my memo pad here. So what I'm going to have to do, students, now please watch this. Somehow I'm going to have to come up with 105 degrees in such a way that I'm either adding, hold on one second, please, that I'm either adding two of these angles together or subtracting them. And how do I know that? Because I'm using my sum and difference identities. And if you'll look at your identities, um, I have um, sine of 
and then it's u plus v or it's u minus v, one of those scenarios. So somehow we've got to use two angles here so that when we um, add them together or subtract them, we'll get 105. Now, I would like to very quickly move this over so that we have it out of the way and we can refer back to it in just a minute. Okay, there we go. Now, let's see if we can't think of two angles, add it or subtract, it will give me 105. Well, right away I think of these two angles here. I think of 60 plus 45. So instead of taking the sine of 105, I'm going to take the sine of 60 plus 45 because 60 plus 45 is 105 degrees. So I haven't changed the problem any. Instead of taking the sine of 105, I'm going to take the sine of uh, 60 plus 45. So here we go. I'm going to take the sine of 60 plus 45 degrees. Notice this will be my U and this will be my V. Okay. So underneath this here, I'm going to go ahead and make a note that U equals 60 and V equals 45. Now you might say, Mr. Earhart, what if I got these two turned around? I called U 45 and V 60. doesn't matter. You're welcome to do that. It wouldn't change anything, okay? No problem. So whenever we have the sign of two angles being added, what it looks like to me is we have sine of U cosine of V plus cosine of u sine of v. So we, can be, we should be able to figure this out very quickly. u is 60, so sine of 60, cosine of v, v is 45, so cosine of 45 plus cosine of u, so cosine of 60 because u is 60, and sine of v, and sine is 45. Okay. Now let's refer to our table. Let's find the sine of 60. The sine of 60, the sine of 60 is square root of 3 over 2. So sine of 60 is square root of 3 over 2. The cosine of 45, uh, cosine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. So we would have square root of 2 over 2. And then plus cosine of 60. Uh, cosine of 60 is 1 half. So we'll have 1 half and then sine of 45. Well, the sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. So, square root of 2 over 2. Now let's multiply these two together. Let's multiply these two together and let's see what we come up with. Square root of 3 times square root of 2 is square root of 6. 2 times 2 is 4, so all over 4. Plus, 1 times square root of 2 is square root of 2 and 2 times 2 is 4. Now we're going to go add these two together. Notice we do have a common denominator. The denominator is 4, so we're going to put a 4 one time, and then we add our numerators together, so square root of 6 plus square root of 2. You cannot put those two together because they do not have the same radicand or inside number. Okay, so the inside number here is 6 and 2, so there is your answer. So you found the sine of 105 using exact numbers. And by the way, on a test, if you wanted to check your answer, all you would have to do is type some sine of 105 into your calculator and get out some decimal number right here, then put equals, and then type this whole expression into your calculator and get out some decimal number and they should match. So you can use a calculator to check your answer. Okay? Alright, so there we go. I'm using sum and difference formulas for number 12. Now let's try the same thing for number 13. Alright? Number 13. Assume that cosine of u is 5 thirteenths and cosine of v is 12 thirteenths. Evaluate cosine of u minus v using exact numbers. Let's take our time and think this through. Okay? First of all, um, let's go ahead and write down cosine of u minus v equals. And now let's look at our trig identities and we would have cosine of u cosine of v cosine of u cosine of v plus sine of u sine of v. Let me get a quick drink of water here. 
Now, students, would you please notice we already know the cosine of u is 513. So for cosine of u, I'm going to put 513. Okay? And notice for cosine of v, we know it's 1213. So cosine of v is 1213. The only thing we have to find is the sine of u and the sine of v. Well, could we not use right triangles to help us? Let me show you, let me show you what I mean. Watch this, for example. Here's a right triangle, okay? We know the cosine of u, so let's put a u right here. We know the cosine of u is 5 thirteenths. So that'd be adjacent over hypotenuse, okay? Do you see how I did that? The cosine of u is adjacent over hypotenuse, 5 thirteenths. And so I drew a triangle. And then using Pythagorean's theorem, I will see that this leg right here is 12. So now that I know all three sides, and now that I know that I have angle what? U. Can I not find the sine of U? Sure I can. The sine of U would be opposite over hypotenuse. So now I know the sine of U is 12 thirteenths. Opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. Now, let's continue on. Notice they gave us right here that cosine of V is 12 thirteenths. So here's your right triangle. Here's your right angle. Here's angle V right here. And we know that the cosine of V is 12 thirteenths. Um, so cosine of V adjacent is going to be 12. The hypotenuse is going to be 13. If you use Pythagorean's theorem to solve for this side over here, you'll get 5. So now I can find the sine of V. The sine of V is opposite over hypotenuse, 5 thirteenths. So there we go. So now we know the sine of V, and now we can go ahead and do some work on these on these fractions. Um, 5 thirteenths times 12 thirteenths would be 60 over 13, plus 12 times 5 would be 60 over 13. Go ahead and add those two fractions together, and you're going to get 120 over 13. And if you want to write that, um, in decimal form. Um, we should use exact numbers, sorry, so we cannot do that. Um, and so the answer is 120 over 13. That's it. There we go. Okay? So really not too difficult as long as you broke it down in steps, step by step, you realize we were using cosine u minus v. So the first thing I did is I wrote down that trig um, identity that we have for cosine of two angles being subtracted. And then once I did that and wrote out what I was looking for, I realized that I knew the cosine of u was given to me. I knew the cosine of u was given to me, but I had to dig and find the cosine of u and the sine of v. Once I found those, I substituted those in and then simplified the math from there. So really, you know, not, not too difficult. Let's continue on. Okay, now like I've taught you guys to do, always go back and check your answer. So I paused the video and I did that like I would expect you to do. And you know how I did it? I used a calculator. I typed in these different numbers here, got angles, typed into my calculator to see what kind of decimals I would get out. And I realized 2 plus 2 just wasn't adding up to 4. So I apologize here. Your old teacher does know how to multiply. Uh, 5 times 12 is 60. And 13 times 13 is 169. Plus 12 times 5 is 60. And 13 times 13 is 169. 69. And now let's go ahead and add our two fractions together. 60 plus 60 is 120, and you leave the denominator 169. And that, students, is going to be the correct answer, okay? So I do apologize for that, and that's why I checked my answers, and that's why you see me quite often pause the video and do that, okay? So my fault, when you multiply two fractions, you multiply the top and the bottom. When you multiply these two fractions, you multiply the top and the bottom. And then when you add two fractions, you make sure you have a common denominator, which we do, and then you add the top and leave the denominator alone. So, okay, moving on to numbers... Uh, 14 and 15, and let's grab this one table here, probably going to need it some more, and let's slide it right down here. All right, using the double angle identity, so go ahead and look on your on your trig identity sheets and find your double angle identities. Using them, um, you're going to solve 14 and 15. All right, so number 14, given that the sine of x equals negative 4 fifths and that x is in quadrant 3, find the sine of 2x, okay? Find the sine of 2x. So here we go. Uh, let's go ahead and get a picture of number 
uh, 14. First of all, it says find the sine of 2x. And so I'm going to go ahead and write this, see if this makes sense. Sine of 2x equals 2 sine x cosine x. Does everybody see where that came from? That's just right off your trig identity sheets. The sine of 2x equals 2 sine x cosine x. Now, think about this. I can bring down my 2, and for sine of x, you already know what you can put. Sine of x equals negative 4 fifths. I'm going to put a negative 4 fifths. What I don't know is what the cosine of x is. So I'm probably going to have to draw a right triangle and find all the three missing sides. So given that sine of x equals negative 4 fifths, 4 fifths and x is in quadrant 3, so we're going to go ahead and draw our triangle in quadrant 3, and we're going to put x right here. See how I did that? It says x is in quadrant 3, so there's my right triangle. Here's angle x, and I know the sine of x is negative 4 fifths. That would be opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite over hypotenuse. Now using Pythagorean's theorem, here's your right angle, I can quickly find this missing leg, it would be 3. Okay. So now that I know all three sides, the only thing I'm missing here is cosine of x. Well, What is the cosine of x? Adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent over hypotenuse. So 3 fifths. But hold it, what is cosine in this quadrant? In this quadrant here, cosine is negative. Cosine is negative, okay? So I know I have a negative three-fifths. So here we go. Put the two over a one and multiply all these together. Two times four times three. Um, uh, a positive times a negative is a negative times a negative is a positive. So I know my whole answer is going to be positive. Two times four is eight times three is twenty-four. And then one times five times five is twenty-five. So there's your answer. Twenty-four 25ths. Okay? Now let's take a look at number 15. Number 15 says um, we're going to find the tangent of 2 pi over 3. Um, use exact numbers for your answers. Now, um, we know we have to use the double angle identity, and I think it'd be really wise to convert this over 2 degrees. So I'm going to say the tangent of uh, 120 degrees because 2 pi over 3 is the same thing as 120 degrees. Now you're being told that you have to use the double angle identity. So watch carefully what I do. That means I somehow want to write tangent so that it's tangent of 2x. Well that shouldn't be too hard to do. 2 times something. So could I not just really say that the tangent of 120 degrees is the exact same thing as 2 times 60, 2 times 60, do you see that okay? 2 times x, 2 times 60, 2 times 6 is 120, so 2 is my 2 and x is 60. So x is 60, don't forget that now as we write the right side of the trig identity, tangent of 2x equals 2 tangent x over 1 minus tangent squared x. Now we know that x is 60 right here so I know up top in this fraction right here I'm going to have 2 and then tangent of 60 all over and then 1 minus and then it's tangent of 60 squared so we're simply going to put tangent squared of 60 degrees. And now um, I'm going to use my table in just a second. And so let me go ahead and get a little space here that we're going to need. And let's grab this right here and let's drag this over to here. There we go. And now let's go ahead and quickly, simply, uh, quickly finish simplifying this. Tangent of 60. Let's see. Tangent of 60. Uh, tangent of 60 is square root of 3, so I'm going to have 2 times the square root of 3 over one minus the square root of 3 squared, okay? 
because the tangent of 60 is the square root of 3, but then we're squaring it. So now we're left with 2 square root of 3 all over. Now, when you square a square root, you just get the number on the inside. So the square root of 3 squared means the square root of 3 times the square root of 3, which is just 3. So 1 minus 3. So next we would have 2 square root of 3 all over negative 2 because 1 minus 3 is negative 2. And now you can reduce these two outside numbers right here. 2 goes into both of them. 2 goes into this negative 1 times and 2 would go into this once. So your final answer would be 1 square root of 3 or just square root of 3 all over negative 1. Now I'll give you credit for that but that's the exact same thing as just simply negative square root of 3. Either one of those two answers would be fine, okay? Either one. So there we go. We just took number 15, and we found the tangent of 2 pi over 3 using exact numbers by using a double angle identity. So not too bad. All right, let's continue on. All right, number 16, and we're finally done. So way to be troopers, way to hang in there. Good job. Use the half angle identity. So let's pause right there. Go ahead and locate in the back of your book or on your trig identity sheet your half angle identities. And once you've found them, continue on. We're going to use half angle identities to find the cosine of pi over 12. Now, if you convert that over to degrees, you will get 15 degrees. So I'm going to do that quickly, 15 degrees. Use exact numbers for your answer. Now, if we're going to find the cosine of 15 degrees and we have to use the half angle identities, I would like to point out to you that if you'll look at your half angle identities, they all say something like sine of x over 2 or cosine of x over 2 or tangent of x over 2. So if I want my whole angle cosine here to be 15, that means I've got to put something over 2 that equals 15. And obviously that's going to be 30, because 30 over 2 equals 15. So here's what we're going to do. Watch carefully, okay? Now there's more than one way to do this, but the directions say I have to use the half angle identities. So because of that, there's only one way to do it. I have to use the half angle identities. All right? So here we go. Um, first of all, I'm going to write down that the cosine of 15 degrees is the exact same thing as the cosine of, are you ready? 30 degrees divided by 2. Okay. Now, if you'll look at your identities, notice it has a plus minus in front of the radical. Well, go back to your very original problem. Please, guys, go back to the very original problem, cosine of 15. As soon as you see 15, you know you're trying to find an answer that lies in the first quadrant because your original problem is 15 degrees and it lies in the first quadrant. And you know in the first quadrant, cosine is going to be what? Well, all the trig functions are positive in the first quadrant, so you know cosine is going to be positive. So since you know you're trying to find the cosine of 15 and you know the cosine of 15 is always going to be positive, then you know right away we're dealing with the positive sign right here, not the negative. So we're going to put the positive sign. And then, of course, we have the square root of 1 plus cosine of x over 2. So 1 plus cosine of x over 2. Very good. Now, if you'll look at your trig identities, it's x over 2. And notice I have a 30 right here, so that means my x is going to equal 30 degrees because I would normally have x over 2 equals this and in place of x I put 30. Why did I put a 30? Because 30 divided by 2 is 15. So my x is going to be 30. So I'm going to say cosine of 30 over 2 or cosine of 15 degrees equals 1 plus the cosine of x. Now we just said that x is 30. So cosine of 30 all over 2. Now using your table of values, what is the cosine of 30? Well here's cosine, here's 30, square root of 3 over 2. So I now have the square root of 1 plus the square root of 3 over 2 all over 2 because the cosine of 30 is cosine of 30 square root of 3 over 2. So now we come up here 
and under my radical, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to put these two fractions together, okay? So 1 plus square root of 3 over 2. Well, 1 is the same thing as 2 over 2 plus square root of 3 over 2 all over 2. And why did I use 2 over 2? Why didn't I use 3 over 3 or 4 over 4 or 5 over 5? Because my denominator, square root of 3 over 2, my denominator was a 2, and I want to have a common denominator, so I use 2 over 2. So now instead of putting a 1 right here, I now put 2 over 2. So now I have the square root of 2 over 2 plus square root of 3 over 2. That would be 2 plus square root of 3 all over 2 all over Two. And of course, the square root goes around everything. All right? So I added my two fractions together, and I got 2 plus square root of 3 over 2. Now let's go ahead and create a little more space here. All right, here we go. Now, I know we're still under a radical, but come on and think about this for a second, guys. Under the radical, I really have 2 plus square root of 3 all over 2 being divided by what? 2 over 1. I mean this is a 2 in the in the denominator. I can really call it 2 over 1. So I have this whole numerator being divided by the denominator. And remember we know that whenever you're dividing fractions you flip the second fraction. So instead of having 1, 2 over 1, we're now going to have 1 half, okay? And now we're ready to go ahead and multiply because once you flip the second fraction, you then multiply. So next, I'm going to have the square root of, all right, 2 plus square root of 3 times 1 would be 2 plus square root of 3, and 2 times 2 would be 4. Now, um, we have the square root of this whole expression. I'm totally fine with you leaving it there. Some of you might want to take the square root of 4 and put this for your answer. <coughs> the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3 all over 2. I'm, I'm fine with either one of these two answers. I really, really am. I don't care. That's totally up to you. Um, you can take the square root of the top and the bottom, and we do know the square root of 4, so we put a 2. Or you can leave it like that, whatever whatever is um, your preference there. But there, we did it. Good job. We found the cosine of 15 degrees using exact numbers. And if you wanted to, you could use a calculator now, and you could type in, I'm going to go ahead and do it for you and show you what I mean. You could type in the cosine of 15 degrees, and you're going to get this. 0.965925 and now type this whole expression in and you should get out the same decimal okay so I'm going to very quickly type in the square root of 3 and then add 2 to that and hit enter and then take the square root of that number and then whatever I get there divide that by 2 and I got the exact same decimal so I know I have the right answer so here is your answer right here or this, okay? Um, I've, I've done a lot of pausing in the video. I know there's been a lot of interruptions. I'm doing this on a Saturday with my kids running around the house and outside and inside and stuff like that, but I hope this has made sense. I um, hope this has been a help to you. This is test number four that we've gone over. We have four more to do next week. Call or email if you have any questions.